Welcome back to the Law of One series, episode 11. And today I'm very excited for our episode as we have a very special guest with us today. Uh, somebody who I consider to be a true spiritual hero of mine. Uh, a man who served as the scribe for the raw material and the current head of l Research, Jim McCarty. So, Jim, thank you so much for coming on the show with me today. It is my pleasure to be here, and I'm looking forward to your questions and anything that you would like to ask. I'll be very happy to try to answer. <laughs> Excellent. I'm looking forward to it as well. I've written down about 500 questions to ask you today, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, we're going to try to keep the interview to about an hour or so because, as Ra would say, I do not wish to deplete this instrument. <laughs> <laughs> So before we get into my questions, I'd like to actually get a quick background from you, uh, since I know that many of our listeners might not actually know exactly how the raw material came to be and um, how you actually became a part of the original trio. So can you just give us a brief summary of how you met Don and Carla back in the late 70s and what it was that sort of brought about the raw contact? Sure. I was part of what was called at the time the Back to the Land movement in the early 70s, where uh, college-educated hippies were moving to the country to simplify their lives regarding Thoreau, say, simplify, simplify. So I bought some land in central Kentucky in the woods, built a log cabin, lived off the grid for six and one half years, and I had a little battery-powered radio that I would occasionally listen to various uh, things on the radio. And one night, May 30th, 1978, I was tuned in to WKQQ Radio in Lexington, Kentucky. And they were interviewing Don Elkins and Carla Ruckert uh, on the topic of UFOs. And they were talking about the philosophy of the UFOs, that we were all one, that we were all on a journey of uh, returning into unity with the Creator. And that interested me very much. So I was trying to figure out how to meet them. And it took me about uh, four or so months. It turned out that in our area, we had food buying co-ops. We uh, would order food that we couldn't grow ourselves. And at one of these meetings, I was talking to a couple from the other side of the same county I lived in. And I was talking to them about this interview I'd heard with Don Elkins and Carla Rucker. They said, well, we're part of their meditation group. We can introduce you. So they did. They took me up to Louisville about 70 miles away. And I started going to the Sunday night meditations uh, for a full year. And after that year, they invited me to join them. Oh, okay, very interesting. So they were pretty much mostly doing kind of UFO research at that time. Is that correct? Uh, they were doing UFO research, but not as much as Don had before Carla joined him in 1968. Uh, the 60s and actually the 70s, in the mid-70s, uh, it's where he got, did most of his research. But after that, when Carla started channeling in 1974, then the channeling became the primary focus of the spiritual journey for both of them. And uh, they began channeling. Uh, Hatan was a fourth density entity back in the, in the 60s when Don had his first experiment where he was trying to uh, teach people how to channel. And then later on, other entities channeled and eventually then uh, when I joined them three weeks later, the raw contact began. Okay, I see. So from what the uh, what you guys stated in the introduction to the raw material, they were doing kind of a group channeling experiment, right? Don was trying to put something together to try and make contact with ETs. Is that right? Right. He, uh, it was 1961. He had been interested in channeling before that, but in 61, he came in contact with information from uh, a fellow uh, that moved here from Detroit. And he brought with him information from a group there that was channeling Hatan, this entity that eventually we would channel. And uh, it gave information as to how you could begin your own group and get the same type of information. It was called the Brown Notebook. And so Don got together some of his students, a dozen of his students from his introduction to physics class at the University of Louisville, where he was teaching. And um, one of those students asked if he could bring along his girlfriend, and that turned out to be Carla Ruckert. So after a while, they were using those techniques that were in the Brown Notebook, but uh, there was a lot of strange sounds being made as uh, lips were smacking and tongues were fucking, and people were opening and closing their mouths, but no words were coming out. Mm -hmm. So eventually, Walt Rogers, who was the head of the group in Detroit, came down to Louisville and began to channel. 
and he, he channeled Hatan and they said, we have contact with you, but all of you are afraid that this is something you're making up in your mind. If right. you will say the words in your mind, more words will be given to you. And so that broke the scientific validity of the contact. But so Don decided, well, I'll just go ahead and gather as much information as I can. So that's where it started for Don and Carla. Although uh, they didn't get together for another seven years. Carla was uh, eventually married her, the fellow that was a boyfriend. And, um, uh, and came back to Louisville after uh, his uh, the boyfriend decided he wanted a divorce. <laughs> okay, after the unsuccessful marriage. <laughs> yeah, so it all happened the way it was, you know, supposed to. I'm sure. Otherwise, it definitely we'd be no did. contact. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Thank you, Lord, for that. So, okay, so the next thing that uh, I think many of my listeners are always, I'm always seeing people asking in the comments is uh, the initial raw contact happened, and correct me if I'm wrong, from one of these group channeling sessions where Carla, I think, just started sort of channeling an entity and it ended up being raw. And then uh, maybe, I think it was Don who said, we need to do a maybe a private channeling session with this entity. Is that kind of how it came about? That's basically it. Um, from time to time, there would be people in the Sunday night meditation group that asked to learn how to channel. And so mm -hmm. she was teaching, she and Don were both teaching one of these students at that time how to channel, but instead of the normal contact coming through, which at that time was Latwi, a fifth density entity, Ra came through. And I, at the time, was out shopping for groceries. So uh, <laughs> I walked through the front door and interrupted the Ra contact right when uh, <laughs> Don asked uh, Ra, about the planetary changes coming up and Ra paused for a moment and said, we must deepen this instrument state. And the uh, reason they had to do that because I walked through the door with my hands full of groceries and saw what was going <laughs> on and walked down the hall into the kitchen and put them away. And afterward, Don said, this is it. We, we've got to, we, we've got, this is what we were waiting for. Wow. Said, Could you transcribe this session as soon as possible? I said, Oh, okay, sure. And when I was transcribing, I thought, yep, this is it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah one of those moments of destiny that you kind of don't realize at the time, but look back on just going, wow, little did I know. <laughs> that's, that's, that was it. Wow. Fascinating. Okay. So then the next question I'd like to ask you is, so since they were doing a lot of these channelings before the raw contact, how much of the kind of original information in the law of one sessions, you know, the concepts of the seven densities, the logos wanderers and things like that, how many of those concepts had already been established through other channelings and how many of those concepts are, were original to the raw contact itself? Well, the idea of there being one original thought of the creator that is the entire creation was a part of channeling from the beginning. So that was the, the, the basic and the advice to meditate and to take time out of each day to commune with the Creator was always the advice of the Confederation of Planets in the service of the Infinite Creator, which is Ra's a part of that too. All of the groups that ever channeled through our group were part of that confederation. Mm. Those were part of it. The details, like the densities, uh, was unique to the Ra contact. Okay. And the information about negatively oriented entities was unique to the raw contact. We hadn't heard mm -hmm. of that before that. Um, and of course, anything on the archetypical mind was totally unique to the raw contact. Uh, yeah. that, so the philosophy was more general, but the, the uh, whole idea of the one original thought and that we could become part of that and we could discover our journeys through meditation was always part of the Confederation channeling. Okay. Fascinating. Yeah, I've, I've always been curious how many of those concepts were totally unique to that contact. And I mean, I imagine that, especially you being the scribe, we're probably sitting there thinking, man, this is some really amazing material. <laughs> yeah. And the energy centers, the way it was described, the, the qualities of each energy center, we knew there were chakras, but we didn't. And we knew the heart was, you know, love, but we didn't know right. so much detail about that as well. Right. Yeah. That's very much true for me as well. When I, when I started reading the raw material, I had some preliminary understanding of the chakras and what they represent. But I think there's a lot of confusion uh, amongst in the spiritual community or maybe differing points of view um, on the chakras. Like sometimes I'll read, you know, about the violet ray, for example, and 
Um, people will lay out all the energies contained in the violet ray and what it, what they represent. But, you know, of course, the raw material, Ra shares that the violet ray is more or less just a readout or a barometer of the rest of the energy body. And right. I found that to be very fascinating. Um, and we'll get into that a little more later. The next kind of questions I'd like to ask you about is about wanderers. Ra states that there are many wanderers coming to the planet right now to aid in the fourth density harvest. And that was, of course, back in the 80s. Um, before 2012, but it made me wonder that if a fourth density soul, let's say, is incarnating on our planet today, born today, um, would they still be considered a wanderer because we're now, you know, a fourth density planet technically? Not really. Uh, Ra did mention that there are entities coming here now that have already graduated from other third density planets, and that this planet will be their fourth density home. So they're wanderers of a kind. But they're mm -hmm. coming here early, before the fourth density is fully in, uh, imbued in the planet. And they're coming here because there's so many opportunities to be of service. Those opportunities are what we would call difficulties and stress and yeah. confusion and separation and anger between mm -hmm. peoples that is on this planet so much now. Those <laughs> are seen as great opportunities to be of service. And it's considered a privilege to come here now during all this turmoil and to try to help alleviate it, to try to bring love and light, to try to bring the planet into the fourth density. Yeah, wow. What an interesting juxtaposition, right? The things that we see as so terrible and we want to avoid and all that are seen from the soul level as the greatest gifts or the greatest opportunities. Absolutely, they are. If we could adopt that point of view now, I think we would get a lot more out of our life incarnations as well in terms of polarization. Well, that's also the uh, suggestion of the Confederation always, you know, look at the difficulties in your life as an opportunity to grow. You know, that's what right. they're for. There are no mistakes. We've all programmed various things that we want to do. And a lot of times, as Ross said, trauma is part of our growth process. So don't be afraid of that. Just realize that it all is well. There are no mistakes. And what you've got right in front of you is what's supposed to be there. Go do it. Yes. Yes, that, that concept, maybe more than any other, I think, for me personally, from the raw material, has given me so much peace of mind in daily living to know that everything is just a catalyst for growth. And it's all meant to be happening, and there are no mistakes in that way. Um, such a, a life-changing realization to have, especially for many of us, like myself, who grew up in religion and were taught that there very much are mistakes and they're of the <laughs> utmost consequence, you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So then Ra talks about the idea of the dual activated body. And I think that's in correlation to the transition into fourth density that our planet's been going through, but that's a subject for me. That's a little bit murky. And I think for a lot of people as well, can you clear up what it means to what a dual activated body is and what it what it represents? Sure, um, I'll do my best. Um, we're in the third density right now, so we have our red, orange, yellow bodies activated. Mm -hmm. uh, the green ray isn't totally activated yet. Right. Uh, so our yellow ray body is the one that we're working with in the third density. It's the group consciousness. We're all trying to work together to help each other get into the fourth density. Now, if entities are able to do that, and I mentioned those entities that are coming here with dual activated bodies have made it. They've gotten into their heart, unconditional love. And that is another body. So the dual activation mm. is the yellow and the green together. And these entities are able to do what we would say uh, have psychic um, abilities mm -hmm. that we don't have usually. Uh, third density entities can have these and many, many do. Mm -hmm. But the uh, entities coming here with dual activated bodies with the green ray activated have the ability many times to do things that we can't do that have been here for so long, even wanderers, mm -hmm. uh, to exercise um, abilities to... Um, feel empath empathy to other people, uh, to maybe do psychic readings, um, various types of uh, extrasensory perceptions mm. that are not normal for third density, but are available to third density and are available to wanderers, but are part of what the, the package that these dual activated bodies entities have. 
So they just have more abilities and um, they're, they've been described throughout the years since the raw contact as crystal children or indigo children, uh, systems busters. They see new ways to do things. Uh, and you know, they, they've, uh, some, some of them have uh, done quite amazing things to change the world. It's more usual that uh, a person would be um, harvestable at the end of the, um, the density, the third density, the cycle, the 75,000 years going through what we're going through right now. Mm -hmm. That this is the time of the harvest and people very likely when they pass from this illusion of the third density are going through the experience of the harvest, walking into the light and attempting to welcome the light as much as they possibly can until it becomes too glaring. And then they step aside and discover, well, I'm in the fourth density. Uh, but entities can, through uh, meditation and the practices of the adept uh, and white ceremonial magic, can uh, achieve that while in the third density here. And these are beings that have had what is called the, uh, the illumination experience, the nirvana experience, the satori, can show, there's names in various cultures for it that they've been able to activate the indigo ray and uh, harvest themselves while they're here and still stay here and become teachers here. So that is something that is rare, but it does happen. So the sort of the experiences of sudden enlightenment or satori as described in the Eastern traditions could be a signpost of a green ray activated body. At least a green ray, right? Yeah. Okay. And maybe up and through indigo ray as well. Right. Okay, fascinating. So then since we are in this transition into fourth density, I know it's a very long transition, uh, evolutionary process. Do you think, you know, I, I wonder a lot about the veil of forgetting in the third density that we've been under and how that transitions to fourth density where there is no veil. Do you think that that, that veil of forgetting is something that just gradually dissipates and you know, as time goes forward, we'll just naturally begin kind of remembering past lives more commonly or how does that look to you? Well, it's something that apparently, according to the recent channels we've had here, is something that's occurring uh, very slowly and is something that will continue to occur. Uh, but as I said before, various individuals can begin to penetrate that veil through meditation and, and again, white ceremony magic and high sexual magic, Ron mentioned. There are various techniques that and can be used to penetrate that veil. But again, these are practices of the adept who has already opened the heart and gone through the blue and is working in the indigo. So it's rare, but it is, it is quite possible. And people are doing that. Okay. Yeah, because I think there's a lot of um, uh, misconceptions amongst people who read the raw material that uh, penetrating the veil means that I'll suddenly remember all my past lives on Sirius and other planets and stuff like that. But I think it might look a little different, yeah? It is very likely that some people may do that. Uh, Ra said, one of the things that Ra mentioned repeatedly was we are all unique. Mm -hmm. And each person's experience of penetrating the veil will be unique. Ah. Each person's experience of activating the indigo ray, contacting intelligent infinity, will be unique. Okay. So there will be qualities of it that are similar, right. but it will also be unique to each person. Right, right. Probably in the same way that every kind of near-death experience is similar in its certain commonalities, but also very unique individually. Right, right. Okay, that helps a lot. Then I guess kind of an off-the-wall question about wandering. Uh, listening to the Ra sessions a few weeks ago, I was listening to the session where Ra speaks of the two entities from their complex who uh, I believe he's, they said were fifth density entities who wandered into the fourth density uh, to be of aid to Ra's planet on Venus, because apparently they were maybe, from their perspective, too overbalanced on the side of love with not enough wisdom. And then that those two entities who incarnated uh, ended up reversing polarity to the fourth density negative in that attempt to be of service. So I was under the impression that the only density that you could wander into would be third density because of the veil. Um, but this um, session sort of indicates that you actually can wander, like a fifth density being can wander to the fourth density. Is that correct? Well, 
in a way, uh, let me backtrack a bit. They wandered into the third density of Ra's experience oh, because okay. the Ra's third density experience was, uh, to some people, it was sickeningly sweet <laughs> because they were very much involved in um, relationships, sexual energy exchanges, uh, philosophical expressions of um, the, the tarot, um, going through the veil and getting information on the tarot and being of service to each other. And about six and a half million of Ra's 38 million were of this nature. The other 32 million tended to look at those that would become Ra in the fourth density mm -hmm. as being a little too sweet. Yeah, yeah. Uh, just, you're just too much. Yeah. So these two <laughs> wanderers saw that attitude among the majority of the population on ah. Venus and thought that they would try to offer a more wisdom-oriented type of service as they were incarnate in Got the it. third density. So as they incarnated, somehow, and this is a mystery exactly how that happens, they became negatively oriented entities going into wisdom and not the heart going into what would be uh, shining the bright light on how things really are, rather than being foolishly, lovingly of service to others, giving of the self, even to martyrdom. Right. Uh, so after they were harvested themselves and they saw that they'd switched their polarities, they were, as Ross said, disconcerted. Right. And when that happened, then it was necessary in order to be able to switch back, they had to stay negative for a certain period of time. Right. Now, this is uh, difficult to understand for me, how they would polarize in the negative sense and yet remain possibly able to switch the polarity later on, but apparently this is what it can happen. Mm -hmm. And they were able to do that with a great deal of effort, as Ross said. And right. then they join Ra in Ra's fourth density as these wanderers who had now switched back to positive polarity and they came in late because it took a while to switch their polarities. And that's how Ra knew what happened to them because they joined Ra for a certain period of time. Okay. So they were with Ra in both the third density and the fourth density. Okay. Okay, that makes sense. That I think that says a lot about how the soul or the soul slash higher self can set up incarnations with a certain trajectory or mission. And uh, those entities wandering to third density, I would imagine were going under the veil of forgetting. So they didn't have a uh, conscious knowing of what their intent was, but they probably had set up their incarnations in a way that would allow them to teach the ways of wisdom to those, uh, to that people group, but becoming cynical, like you were saying towards the overabundance of, compassion and sweetness and all that could have, could have caused them to become so cynical that they actually reverse polarity. So right. Each of, us, each of us makes those pre-incarnated choices. And that is something that in uh, philosophy has been called predeterminism. Right. But in the incarnation, free will is supreme. Right. Uh, you may not pay attention to how your subconscious biases the catalyst that comes your way in accordance with those pre-incarnated choices. You may decide, I want to do something else and go another direction. And it may be good. It mm -hmm. may not be so good. Uh, or it may be like these wanderers. It may be totally opposite of what you'd hope for. Right. Yeah. That's, that's why wandering is such a risk, right? Because you could end up, you know, the exact opposite that you intended. Well, that's why Ross said there were very few fourth density wanderers because it takes a great deal of what they said, foolhardiness or bravery, depending upon your point of view, to come into the third density as a wanderer because the problem is remembering in some degree why you're there. And it takes usually the fifth or sixth density type of polarization to be able to do that. Right. But fourth density wanderers are here but not so many of them for that reason. Right, right. So would you say then that because the soul's frequency or vibration increases through the densities, that it's 
maybe a safer gamble for a fifth or sixth density being to wander than maybe a fourth whose vibration might be not high enough to maybe penetrate the remembrance of their intention of being there and all that or being influenced by the catalyst. That's definitely a very strong part of it. Also, I think is that uh, fifth and sixth density entities have been wanderers more, f more often. They've had the experience and there's a, a type of uh, uh, a knowledge that comes with that uh, uh, in your being so that you are uh, more likely to remember. But it's mentioned a number of times that wanderers have significant difficulties on right. planet earth because the vibrations are so different from their home planet, their home vibration. So there are, uh, there are things that each wanderer has to consider. Uh, if you have difficulties in your life, it could well be because you're a wanderer and that uh, right. these vibrations just aren't harmonizing with you. And it's just a hard place to be. Right. Yeah. And that's, that's probably why Ross says that most wanderers are sixth density because they're looking to achieve that balance of love and wisdom, right? And so they might choose certain very difficult, from our perspective, very difficult catalysts like a, a disease or a physical ailment or a type of abuse in the childhood that will force them to learn the ways of wisdom or of love. Right, right. Those types of lessons are, are difficult, but those types of lessons teach you a great deal. If you can find the love in the moment, yeah. in those lessons, you've achieved a great deal. Yeah, the most opportunity for growth, for sure. Yeah. Okay, so then there's a, there's a session where you guys talk a lot about the, uh, the cat Gandalf yeah. and uh, the different you know, physical ailments that Gandalf was experiencing and, and Don's very concerned if they should get surgery or whatnot. And uh, I guess you could see that as maybe like a second density catalyst. <laughs> but the question that actually came up for me when I was listening to that session was in the same way that uh, a third density human sort of serves as a catalyst for a second density pet and, you know, being around a third density vibration uh, as the pet learns its name and rules, boundaries, limitations, affection and all that. Those are kind of like third density catalysts that maybe help a second density soul, like a pet, to evolve faster. Would you say that that's a good analogy or comparison for what planet Earth does for the rest of the collective who might be in third density, as now the planet itself has become fourth density, that it kind of its vibration helps pull along the third density souls on the planet? I would say uh, that's correct. Um, our our mother Gaia has a relationship with each of the entities on this planet. And this type of a relationship is something that has been difficult over the years because there's so many people that have been repeating third density on earth, have come from other planets where they failed to make it, and have been engaged in bellicose actions, in war, and in using uh, atomic energy and different types of energy for a negative purposes, separation and control. And that these vibrations have gone into the planet Earth, into the crust of the planet. And before uh, our mother Earth can be graduated in, fully into the fourth density, these vibrations uh, have to be released in some fashion. And in many times it's volcanoes and earthquakes and so mm. forth, because this anger of separation seeps right. into the crust of the planet and is released this heat has to be released. And so our mother earth is doing that. And we are, if we are paying attention enough to our spiritual journeys, we realize that humanity throughout the years is responsible for injuring a great deal of the surface of the planet, our mother earth right. herself, so that there needs to be a, a healing of the planet. And many people, as Ra said, are using visualization and meditation to attempt to heal those ruptures in the, uh, the garment of the planet and to heal our relationship with Mother Earth so that we all can go together into the fourth density of love and understanding. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So then from your, I guess, from your personal opinion, do you think that this whole COVID pandemic we've been experiencing might be kind of one of those manifestations of Mother Gaia releasing that anger of separation from the collective? I think that and the uh, demonstrations for racial equality are all efforts to find a path of unity amongst us all, 
bringing all of this to the front, the forefront, so that it has to be looked at. Uh, we keep our distance in, uh, in a certain way in order to help others not catch any disease. We find other ways to be of service. We look at the demonstrations where there's been racial inequality, and there's so many people now that see how that needs to change, and in one way or another, they're adding their energy to this change. These are times that are turbulent times, but being of that nature, they offer a greater opportunity, I believe, for people to discover a spiritual journey that has all inclusiveness as the foundation stone, and that we can use these difficult times to polarize more positively and to be of service of others. It's not just separating for the, con the, the necess necessity of keeping from getting the disease, but of realizing that we are all in this together, that this is something that we all need to work together to find a solution. And here in the United States, we're not doing that great a job right now. <laughs> we're kind of the black sheep of the world yeah. because we, we put our economy getting back to the normal economic status ahead of getting rid of the COVID-19. So now a lot of people are having to backtrack here in Kentucky. Uh, there's a wildfire of disease uh, beginning to happen again. So we have to backtrack and, and do what other countries have done right away. You know, uh, so yes, this is a chance to learn. Probably one of the greatest chances we'll ever have. Yes. And I'm so glad you said that because you know, most of what people are wanting to talk about right now is the pandemic, the conspiracy theories of, oh, this is what's really happening. Let me tell you, it's it's the cabal that are secretly planning whatever. And I think that you can get lost in that maelstrom really easily if you want to. But the way that I've sort of chosen just to look at this whole situation is just like you said, as an act or an opportunity rather for polarization and growth. Nobody loves wearing a mask in public 24 seven. Um, even when I go to the gym, they, you have to wear a mask at the gym. So I'm like literally on the treadmill sprinting with a mask on, you know, breathing in my own carbon dioxide, just going, oh, this isn't very fun, but I just choose to look at it right as this is my act of service to the world my act of love of, Hey, if, if me wearing a mask can save one person, then that's what's really important. Yeah. And I think, uh, yeah, it's just an opportunity for all of us to look inside ourselves and say, all right, let me put my ego aside and what my ego wants to say about this and just do what is being asked of me by society for the betterment of, of the collective, right? That's well stated, well stated. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, we'll transition now to uh, the next subject I wanted to ask you about. Uh, the archetypal mind is another one that you mentioned in the beginning that is also kind of murky for me because it's such a, a dense uh, area of, of subject matter. But I guess what I would ask you, because it's too much to like dive deeply into, is could you give like a brief summary of what the archetypal mind is and sort of like how it's broken down maybe and just why it's an important area of study for the adept? Well, the archetypical mind has the mind, the body, and the spirit and the choice. There are 22 major arcana in the Tarot, and those are the ones that Ra developed on Venus. They describe the nature of our evolution. They're like a blueprint or architecture. So that, just take the first two, uh, the magician and the high priestess, the conscious mind and the unconscious mind. Those first two are the basic way that we develop our conscious awareness in this illusion, the third density. Mm. The subconscious mind, there's a veil between the conscious and the subconscious. So the magician and the high priestess have this veil between them. But the high priestess is always giving information to the magician, to the conscious mind. Our right. subconscious minds are always helping us with our pre-incarnative choices by coloring the way we see how catalyst comes to us. Catalyst is the third card. So the catalyst comes to us and we process it consciously one way or another, more or less efficiently, and we learn. What we learn then, it becomes experience. That's recorded in the fourth card, the experience. Mm -hmm. And all of this together 
forms the significator, our significant self through all incarnations. This mm -hmm. is happening through all incarnations so that we have a certain kind of a soul or significant self that has learned certain lessons and knows that there are other lessons yet to learn. And there are transformations that are necessary in order to learn them. So the sixth card is a transformation. And the seventh is the great way. All of these seven cards then work together to process, help us process in our conscious and unconscious behaviors, the catalyst we program. In other words, to learn, to grow, to polarize, to be of service to others. There's an interaction between all these cards, and it works also for the body and the spirit. We know a whole lot more about the mind than we do body or spirit because we were able to question in depth and to finish the mind. We only got general concepts for the body and the spirit, but they're, they're generally the same for all three. And that's, the, that's basically it. It's an architecture or a blueprint right. that gives us an idea about how it is we grow how it is we polarize. Okay. I like that definition a lot of a, a blueprint of how the soul grows or evolves into awareness. Yeah. That's very helpful. There's a, there's a session that uh, I find really interesting where Ross says something along the lines of much of what people uh, study when it comes to the archetypical mind, the areas of study are actually the functions of the archetypes, but not the archetypes that in and of themselves. Right. And I found that to be a very interesting dichotomy because, you know, in astrology, we have tarot, uh, different systems that help us to understand those functions of the archetypes. But uh, Ra kind of encourages us to actually look at the archetypes as things in and of themselves. Right. Yeah. Uh, the relationships is what astrology gets into. And Ra right. doesn't say that astrology is, is not a helpful practice. It's just not one that they wish to have included in the tarot because it has certain distortions. They wish to have the astrology studied by itself so that the tarot or the major arcana of the tarot could be studied as the qualities that each of us have. And th these are the things in themselves right. that uh, are, are particular uh, to each other. They, have, uh, they each have something to offer us in particular. And uh, so that was the, the basic reason that Ross suggested that we uh, divorce the astrology. You know, whenever we were questioning something on the card that was astrological in nature, they said, release that from its stricture because it's mm. a distortion. And you need to study that in another way. And the, actually they suggested meditation was the best way to study the relationships or the astrological relationships. So the tarot though, it was uh, supposed to be studied as qualities or these things that are defined within certain guidelines and can be utilized in a practical sense in our lives. Right. Okay. I'm, I'm glad you said that as well, because I hear a lot of feedback from friends of mine or people online who are big uh, astrology fans who say, oh, Rod doesn't like astrology or Rod doesn't think astrology is helpful. <laughs> I'm like, no, that's not actually the case at all. He's just, like you said, he's explaining the difference between areas of study and I think also there's a passage where Ra does say that uh, both the tarot and astrology are very helpful mediums that the adept can use individually to study the archetypal mind. And that once you've, you know, really dove into one of those mediums, be it the tarot or astrology, that it's helpful to go to the other one as well, just to get a nice kind of 360 degree view. Right. Yeah. So you can use them all. Yeah. So there's... Essentially, uh, seven major arcana for the mind, seven for the body, seven for the spirit. And then the 22nd is the choice, correct? Right. And then, so is it that there's the matrix, the potentiator, the significator, each for mind, body, and spirit? Is that right? Right. Yeah. And the catalyst and the experience, the transformation, and the great way. They're all the same. They're all okay. the same categories for mind. For body and for spirit right okay that's very helpful wow i finally feel like i understand the archetypal mind a little bit better <laughs> thank you for that that was great it is definitely the most challenging information that, that rob brought through but you could tell that rob was so excited to be talking about it because occasionally <laughs> yeah. they would say oh student you have barely yeah. grasped that which was intended <laughs> the oh student you know yes yes let you I know said that, that as well they're, they're excited about it <laughs>
Look again, O oh student. <laughs> right. One of the areas that is actually spoken of a lot in the raw material that doesn't get as much attention from people, I think, is that of the sexual energy exchange. And so, you know, when I read the material on, on those passages, I find myself coming up with a lot of questions um, because it is, again, kind of another area that there's a lot, there's a lot of density to that subject material. But my, I think my first question that comes up for me when I listen to those uh, sessions is how Ra talks a lot about how sexual energy can be a very powerful catalyst for spiritual polarization. And so I guess I'll make a statement and you can let me know if you think it's accurate or not, according to the raw material. But just to kind of put it in practical terms for everyone, could we say that um, having sexual intercourse with your partner as an act of service to them, meaning you're thinking of their pleasure, their fulfillment rather than your own, is what would create positive polarization. And then uh, sexual intercourse used as an act of domination or control over the other for your own pleasure would be negative polarization. That's absolutely correct. Okay, great. That's more or less how Ra lays it out, but you know, Ra tends to speak in very <laughs> grandiose language. Right. They talk mostly about how the sexual energy transfers between Carla and myself were helpful in powering the raw contact. Right. Because they, uh, we discovered it on our own. We had to make a lot of discoveries on our own because free will was the, the, the basic quality that they wanted to ensure was always uh, maintained. So they right. couldn't tell us a lot of things that would help out. But we discovered ourselves that if we had uh, sexual intercourse the night before a session, the session was much longer wow. than if, if we didn't. So that increased Carla's vital energy, which was what Ra used in the contact in order to be able to speak the words. When her vital energy ran low, then they said it, you know, it was time to close. Yeah. So uh, Carla had very little physical energy and uh, the vital energy it was a combination of the mind, the body, and the spirit energy used in a spiritual function or way. And so we dedicated the sexual energy transfers to the raw contact. Now, I believe that any other entities, uh, any other couples could use this sexual energy transfer in the same fashion in order to further their own spiritual journeys. They could dedicate it to the one creator, seeking the one creator, so that it would not only be shared between them, but it would be a vehicle in which they could uh, more effectively seek the one creator and the experience of the creator in, uh, mm -hmm. in experiencing it in higher and higher energy centers or chakras. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's, there's a passage where Ra explains the types of energies that uh, the masculine principle and feminine principles will translate to one another. And I believe they say that uh, the male principle is higher in, I think, vital energy. The female principle is higher in love and compassion. And so when the mated pair exchanges that sexual energy, the female will be left with more vital energy from the male. And the male will be left with a feeling of more love and compassion sent from the female. Is that correct? In general, uh, there's a more specific type of uh, description though I think might be helpful. The male has physical energy. Physical. That is uh, more abundant than most females. And right. most females have the emotional and mental energy that uh, inspires the male. And those are in general. Um, so the vital energy is a quality of its own so that you see the, the mind, the body, and the spirit uh, contributing to vital energy when they are used in a spiritual function. Got it. Yeah. Okay. That, that helps clarify then. So then would you say that basically, you know, in, in terms of exchanging green ray energy, that two people in a loving partnership who have sexual intercourse are just automatically exchanging the green ray energy or does it require something more than that? The green ray energy has to be activated within each entity's heart chakra. Okay. Being able to see all people as the creator is the basic quality and be able to love unconditionally all people just because they're there, because you know they're the creator. 
that opens the heart center. And that is the place where the energy transfers begin. If the heart is not open, these transfers can't happen. The heart has to be open. And once you get to the heart, then the other centers are, op are potentially available to be opened, depending upon your own individual spiritual journey, where you've gotten in your own seeking. I see. Okay. So it's not enough necessarily for two people just to love one another to exchange green ray energy, but they have to actually have done spiritual work on their own green ray first. Right. Okay. And the same would go for blue ray or indigo ray transfer. Yeah. Yeah. The, tra the energy transfer begins at the green ray. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Cause Ra does talk a little bit about how in a more of a negatively polarized sexual energy exchange, it's always going to be, you know, red ray or orange ray primarily, right? Yeah. Negative energy can be transferred in the uh, yellow and the orange, but it's negative. It's one controlling another. Right. Right. Okay. Fascinating. Okay. Then I think we're going to end on a, the juiciest possible topic from the raw material. <laughs> um, you know, we're in such interesting times right now in so many ways. And I think I've personally been fascinated by this and I'd love to hear your, your take on this by just the amount of, or the frequency or the increase of UFO sightings recently, not just by the average Joe, but like our actual military personnel, uh, fighter pilots going on podcasts, showing video footage saying, Hey, we saw this thing. 11 of us saw it on radar with our naked eye. You know, it was shaped like a Tic Tac. It flew right past us. It defied gravity. We have no explanation for it. We're seeing so many more instances like this happening now. And I also find it interesting that during this whole time of the pandemic, um, the, you know, the George Floyd incident and all this kind of collective pandemonium that suddenly the, the Pentagon comes out, I think maybe a week ago and says, Hey, you know, we have, uh, we have possessed craft that we know for a fact was not created here on planet earth. <laughs> it's like, how is this not the only thing anyone's talking about right now? <laughs> so, so that gets me thinking about a lot of things and, and especially when it comes to, you know, the raw contact and how raw explains why there are some UFO sightings, why ETs have contacted earth in the past. And Ra says that, you know, they came to Egypt because it wasn't a violation of Egypt's free will because they were a pantheistic society at that time and all of that. And so, you know, this gets me thinking about the Fermi paradox. And, you know, for those listeners who may not know what the Fermi paradox is, it's essentially just like the more of the scientific term for the question of if the universe is infinite as it appears to be, and we know there's trillions of planets in the habitable zone and there should be life out there. Um, why don't we see aliens flying all over the place all the time, right? <laughs> so my, I have sort of like a personal theory about the Fermi paradox that became pretty apparent to me from reading the raw material, and I'd love to hear your take on it. And it's essentially that I think, as Ra explains, you know, higher density beings of the positive polarity, like you've said, their utmost concern is preservation of free will. And not only for us, but for their own polarization, they don't want to infringe on, on that. So I, I think that the reason we don't have contact yet is because probably um, higher density beings are maybe waiting for us to initiate contact. Say, hey, we know you're out there. We're open and ready for contact. And until we do that, you know, more or less collectively, I would think, um, they're probably not going to contact us out of preservation for our own free will. But I think Ra does also mention that there are many um, UFO sightings that happen because these higher density beings are trying to, I think they say, kind of open us to the mysterious and get us adjusted to the fact that we're not alone in the universe. So what do you have to say about all of that and what your maybe your personal theory is? Well, Ra suggested that the UFO um, phenomenon was one which was hopefully going to introduce people to the concept of the unknown and the unknown and infinity. Once we could begin to begin to think about those concepts, then we will be opening ourselves to a greater path of seeking within ourselves. If we think about the infinity of all the creation, then you wonder who made it? Uh, where did it come from? How do I fit into this? Uh, is there some philosophy that can describe this? 
and then you become a seeker of truth. And as you become more and more a seeker of truth, then more of that truth of the unity and infinity of all things becomes available to you. In your own journey, uh, the right book, the right person, the right experience at the right time starts happening. These coincidences, the synchronicities start happening. So it's all because this one thing, this one UFO, unidentified flying object, where was that? Who was that? How was that? Um, are they part of this infinity? They're, it's meant to get us to start thinking, you know, to, right. to, uh, to exercise our minds and then to exercise our spirits and our desire to know. We all have the creator within us. The creator made us all. And there is something inside each of us that wants to be explored and wants to be shared and wants to share. And this uh, UFO is just a, a catalyst towards that end of discovering that we are all uh, infinite beings. We are all part of the creator. We're all here to help each other. We're here to be of service. We're here to you know, take planet Earth into the fourth density uh, under whatever conditions are necessary. If it's got to be a pandemic and demonstrations for racial equality, so be it. Let's do it together. Let's work on this. Let's see what we can find out. So uh, I, I believe that, uh, you know, the UFOs throughout our history have had that purpose to make us question uh, what is infinity? What is the unknown? And how do I fit into it? How do we mm -hmm. all fit into it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, beautifully said. So then do you think that the, at least it seems to me like the, the sightings and encounters are increasing a lot as of late. Do you think that might be happening as a result of the fact that our planet just kind of did shift into fourth density and in the same way that wanderers would come to our planet to aid in that transition? Maybe UFO sightings are sort of doing the same thing? It could well be that. Uh, for me, um, I would say that there is, there are people who are able to see those UFOs and other people can't, although there are, as you said, the, uh, video footage of these UFOs. Usually there is some specific group of people that is uh, susceptible to being inspired by such a sighting, that they have eyes to see and ears to hear that others do not have. Uh, I think maybe there is more of a general awareness of these uh, UFOs now, hoping that more people will consider the possibility that uh, there are not only UFOs, but there is a greater uh, story behind these UFOs, that it's not something that is so uh, alien to us, shall we say. It's something right. that we can all share together and something in which we all have a stake, uh, a reason to want to grow together, that these are you know, to inspire us to do that. Yeah, because it has been sort of, uh, I guess, hypothesized or theorized for many decades now that our government has known about, you know, ET contact or, or UFOs and have purposely kept it a secret from the collective so not to incite pandemonium or fear or what have you. But I think it might also be for more selfish motives like keeping certain technology or, or whatnot. But, you know, there was the, the whole Bob Lazar, you know, uh, incident in 1989 he came on the news and said hey i've been back engineering this craft with in a base s4 here in nevada and all that and people you know it's so um kind of out there that people just go oh wow fascinating and just kind of don't think much about it but the implications are so large right and i think that maybe the our government i find it interesting the timing the way it's happened that during this whole pandemic you know i think that there's so many sightings happening by our own military like i said uh, people going on radio shows, podcasts, news stations, just openly talking about this, people with credentials that are uh, believable, that I think that maybe the pressure is getting turned up a bit on our government to where they're like, okay, we're, we're going to have to let the cat out of the bag that we've known about this for a long time and have kept it secret. So when is a good time to divulge this information? And, you know, as soon as the, <laughs> this whole pandemic hits, they're like, hey, by the way, we have UFOs. Carry on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a wild and crazy world, and UFOs are a part of it, and they have a message for us. 
Uh, Ross suggested that uh, in the past, they were only able to walk among the Egyptians when there was an entire consensus of the culture in which they were contacting. And I think that's basically probably going to be the rule here too. Uh, and it's rather doubtful that we could all come to a consensus on UFOs, although anything is possible. Uh, Ross suggested that uh, the possibility for this planet uh, to have a, a harvest of uh, everybody is very small, but it's still there. In one right. fine, strong moment of inspiration, we could all choose to polarize positively. So the possibility is there. The probability isn't so great. Right. But we can never, as they said, turn our back on the possibility because it is ever present. So the possibility of UFOs uh, coming amongst us all and everybody being able to accept them is small, but it's there. Uh, so we, we just have to be open, open in our hearts and open in our minds and open in the way we uh, consider what might happen. Right. Yeah, well said. There, there are some people who I've had many conversations like this who will you know, immediately be skeptical of the validity of the raw material because Ross says kind of in the opening sessions that, you know, they visited Egypt. That's kind of where the origin of their name comes from. That's what they were named by the Egyptians. And people will kind of read that and go, well, oh, come on. You expect me to believe that, oh, they just happened to visit back then, but they don't visit us now. And we're so much more evolved than that, those cultures were. <laughs> but I think actually the opposite is true, right? Where because the world was isolated back then, there wasn't internet, TV, social media. There was no um, collective communication. Each culture was kind of an island in that sense, right? Where they right. could sort of pick and choose what culture they can visit. And I think they said they visited some cultures in Latin America, maybe the Mayans or something, um, because they were, you know, they met the requirements of being pantheistic and all of that. But in today's world, everything is connected. You know, we have the internet, we have TV, so. The whole planet is essentially one civilization now. So the qualifications might be a little harder to meet in that way, right? I think so. But it's possible. Yes. Yeah, and I'm very hopeful that, you know, these kinds of uh, events that are happening in our world today are bringing us together more and more as time goes forward. And I think we will get to a point soon where, you know, we're, we're so aware of our own problems, whether that's government corruption or polluting the planet or all the other things we could name where we say, you know, we're glad that we're not alone. Uh, we, we would like to receive higher wisdom from, you know, higher density beings who can maybe help us out with our collective issues. But again, we have to come together first as a collective to ask for that help. And I think, you know, who, who knows how long that might take, but I'm very hopeful for the future in that way, because there's a lot of you know, nobody could have seen any of this coming in 2020, but I think the amount of sort of collective shadow work that we're doing through this is just profound. And the positive effects from that are, are going to be seen in our very near future. I think you're very right. I think you're very right. <laughs> well, Jim, thank you so, so much for coming on the show today. It's been an absolute pleasure speaking with you and getting to pick your mind a little bit. Um, before we go, just tell us where people can reach you, find out more about l, &L Research and the work that you guys are doing. We have an archive website, uh, www.llresearch.org. Now that has all of the information that we've ever gathered uh, in a number of books uh, and channelings, and everything is available for free in the form of PDFs. You can download whatever we've done with no charge at all. We have books that you can buy if you wish to have it in a book form. Um, and that's basically, uh, and we also have a, a social website, uh, www.bringforth4th.org, which uh, people can engage in forums and they can talk back and forth about various topics of the law of one. Uh, so those are the two ways to get a hold of us right now. Eventually, those two are going to be joined together. We're going to have in one new website in the next few months. So. It'll still be the archive website, so uh, llresearch.org. So uh, come see us, see what we've got. We're happy to share with you uh, for free. That was Don's great dream, is to share all this information worldwide for free. And the internet has allowed uh, us to do that. 
Yeah, definitely. Well, I'll be putting all those links in the description box below. And you guys also have a YouTube channel, right? Where I've seen recently you're putting together a lot of really great kind of short uh, video episodes on certain topics from the Law of One. And I found those to be extremely helpful and I know many have as well. So I'll be putting the link to that in the description box below also. Well, thank and, you so uh, much. Oh, absolutely. And I think I speak for all of us, Jim, when I say thank you so much just for personally the work that you've done and, and bringing this, this material forward into the world, you know, along with Don and Carla. For myself, you know, it's been life changing, wouldn't begin to describe it. So thank you for that. And thank you again so much for being on the show today. Well, thank you for having me. It's been a great honor and I've enjoyed it a great deal. Thank you, Jim. All the best. <laughs>